Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Ryan Coulson. And Megan Robinson. And uh, I'm Max Kirkpatrick. And today we will be presenting our research from the last eight weeks for the Continuum Robotics RU here at UW STEP. And the topic is Bendy Arm. User testing of a continuum manipulator for assistive technology. And the ARM stands for Assistive Robotic Manipulator. So first of all, what is a continuum manipulator? Continuum manipulators are robots that are inspired by the limbs of certain biological organisms. For example, the trunk of an elephant or the tentacle of a squid. Now what's special about these particular limbs is that they can bend continuously along their entire length. This is as opposed to, say, my limb, which can only bend at certain joints, or the limb of a traditional robot that you might see in a factory setting. Now in order to achieve this capability of continuous bending, these robots need to be constructed of compliant materials. Uh, and so, well you can imagine that you, know, you, need a, you need a material that can bend a little bit in order to achieve that bending. Um, and additionally, because they can bend continuously, these robots have infinite degrees of freedom. And so these two aspects the infinite degrees of freedom and the compliant materials of which continuum manipulators are made imbue them with this quality of compliance, which is very important to them. And by compliance, what I mean is that these manipulators will conform to their environments. And so that means that when they collide with something, instead of maintaining their original shape, they yield and conform to the shape of whatever they can uh, collide with. And this compliance is really the most important quality of continuum manipulators. Uh, by the way, that picture in the top right is an example of a continuum manipulator, which as you can see, looks very similar to the one that we have constructed. So like I was saying, the compliance is a very important aspect of these manipulators. Uh, and it really is the key aspect that differentiates them from traditional robots. And it's the aspect that makes them uh, very suitable for assistive technology. And the reason for this is because, as you can imagine, in assistive technology, you experience a very close human-robot interaction. And when there is this close human-robot interaction, one of the main concerns is the safety of the user with regards to uh, the robot. And so you can imagine that when a traditional assistive robot, like the one shown here, the Jayco arm, is being used, if it were to collide into the user, it would have potential to cause harm to that person because it's a hard, rigid robot. However, when a continuum robot collides with an individual, as I said, it just conforms to them, and there's no real opportunity for harm. And so this is why continuum robots make so much sense in the assistive technology field. So I've told you what a continuum manipulator is and why it makes sense to use an assistive technology. Now from a more academic standpoint, what are the uh, knowledge gaps in the academia that we're filling? Well, continuum manipulators are a fairly uh, well-developed field. However, while many of these robots have been designed and many applications have been proposed, hardly any of these have really been tested. In fact, in the assistive field, there's only really one robot in the entire field of continuum manipulators that has been used for an assistive purpose before, and this is a robot that was used to demonstrate, well, it hasn't actually been tested yet. It's been built, but not tested, and this is a robot that's meant for helping people in bathing. And so that's really the gap we're trying to fill, is using our robot in actual user testing for a specific application, which is assistive tech. Okay, um, so I'm going to start and walk you through some of the design aspects of uh, Bend the Arm. Um, and uh, I'm going to explain how we went about building this uh, and how it actually functions. So uh, Bend the Arm is uh, built of a flexible backbone. So we have like uh, this backbone material here. It's low density polyethylene, LDPE. Um, it bends with a relatively low force and is relatively good at resuming its shape after being bent. Uh, and it's actuated by eight tendons. So there are eight cables. They're very hard to see on this picture uh, that run the entire, well, four of them run the entire length and four of them run half the length. 
of the arm. And these tendons pull on the, uh, this here and here, and in doing so they can push and pull the arm in different directions. Uh, this causes the arm to bend, and then to ensure that this arm bends with sort of constant curvature, which makes it a lot easier to model and to understand, uh, we have these discs here that uh, are spaced at uniform distances, um, and all the tendons route through the disc. So that sort of ensures that you get a much more uniform curve as opposed to just like attaching a uh, string to the end of the stick and pulling on it. That'll cause it to bow out in the opposite direction. Uh, so these, these discs help make the bend much more uniform. Um, so there are two sections to the arm. Uh, first section ends here, so this is the proximal section, and then this is the distal section. Um, each section is driven by four, uh, ten uh, four tendons that are um, actuated by 125 ounce inch NEMA 23 stepper motors. Um, and as I mentioned before, all the tendons are routed through these discs. Um, you can see these four stepper motors on the top, they're offset by 90 degrees each, so that uh, is how we get uh, actuation along two different planes. So this is one plane, this is the other plane, if I can do that. Uh, and that causes uh, our ability to actuate these in pairs. So that what we do is we actually actuate one motor in one direction and the motor on the opposite side in the exact opposite direction at the same speed, and that causes the robot to bend along the plane defined by those two motors. Uh, we can then move the robot out of that plane by using the other set of motors. So we can get to positions that are variously placed uh, within sort of a sphere around the arm. Uh, combining that with the motion of the second stage as well gives us even more flexibility in where we can position the arm. So now we have a total of uh, four bending pairs uh, that can move us around in space. This gives us a total of eight controlled degrees of freedom because there are eight motors actuating the tendons. Um, and as such, we can reach very complicated positions, uh, sort of S-curves, uh, wrapping in around itself, wrapping around the objects, that sort of thing. So we can, we can reach some pretty uh, strange configurations with that. Um, one other aspect about this and its design, and this is sort of a drawback, is the fact that the two sections are mechanically coupled. So as I mentioned before, the uh, tendons run through both sections. So here's the, uh, the tendons running for the second stage. They run through the routing for the first stage. As such, when you pull on those tendons, you actually affect the motion of the whole arm, not just the top stage. Um, and so there's sort of a mechanical <coughs> coupling between the two segments. As we actuate one, we inherently affect the position of the other, and vice versa. So uh, it's pretty clear to see, like when we move the bottom section, remain, uh, keep the top one stationary, the top cables are static and they pull back against the motion uh, induced by the bottom segment, and this causes the top segment to sort of maintain a constant orientation under that move. So it sort of like continues pointed in the same direction as the bottom segment moves underneath it. Uh, and sort of we get an opposite result if we actuate the top segment without actuating the bottom. We bend the entire arm as opposed to just bending uh, just the top section. So that's one of the problems that we look to address um, through user control and such like that. Great. Um, so there are three different ways to control bendy arm. There's dual joystick control, single joystick segmented control, and single joystick compensated control. And in the top right picture, you can see kind of our control panel, and each one uses it differently. Um, so in dual joystick control, that's probably the most straightforward of the three. We use the left joystick con to control the bottom segment of the arm, and the right to control the top. Um, don't use any of the other switches, except for the electromagnet switch to turn it on and off. Um, we also have single joystick segmented control. Uh, the main difference here is that you're only using one joystick instead of two. So here you only use the right joystick, and then um, there are three modes to switch in between. In the first mode, you move the entire arm, um, so it moves both segments at the same speed at the same time in the same direction, so that's good for quick general positioning. Um, then when it comes to like the fine tuning of the position of the arm, you're going to want to use the other two modes, which um, control the, top, the bottom and the top, respectively. Um, then, of course, as Max mentioned, the robot is mechanically coupled, so you will get some undesired motion in the segment that you aren't currently controlling, which is where the inspiration for the third control scheme came from, the single joystick compensated control scheme. Um, only has two modes. The first mode is the same as the first mode in single joystick segmented, moves the whole arm. And the second mode allows you to move just the top, and the bottom segment will move. Sorry. 
bottom segment will move in the opposite direction at a reduced speed to kind of counteract or compensate for that undesired motion you get in the bottom segment as a result of moving the top. So it makes um, control of the top segment a little bit easier, a little bit more intuitive for the user. And then of course, in any of the three control schemes, you can click the joystick and it will send the robot into a recentering protocol. Basically just returns the robot to a neutral position. And once it is in that neutral position, it goes through a slack removal procedure. Um, you can see our setup here. We have eight limit switches, one for each tendon. Um, so all the slack removal procedure does is check all of the limit switches. If any of them are open, meaning that one of the tendons is loose, it will coil that tendon until it is taut. And that's just a good way to remove some of the slack that's been acquired as a result of overextending the arm in any direction. So that's the design of the robot. Now we move on to really the meat of our research, which is the user testing. Uh, before we describe the user testing that we performed with the robot, it makes some sense to describe precedent in user testing uh, from previous studies. So on the assistive tech side of things, um, as I pointed out earlier in the bottom uh, section of the intro slide, the uh, Jacob arm manipulator is an example of a currently commercially available assistive robotic arm that is in use. And so really that's kind of like the ultimate form of user testing if you think about it because it's moved beyond just being tested and now it's actually being used by people in their everyday lives. Uh, on the continuum manipulator side of things, user testing is much less developed as I was uh, describing previously. And in fact, there's really only two designs that have undergone any kind of user testing in the literature, uh, and that can all be summed up in three papers, really. Uh, one is the Octarm, which has been used in field trials uh, in a very uh, non-formal sense, where they didn't really record any kind of quantitative data. Um, it's also been used in a more rigorous study that did record quantitative data. However, this study involved using the octarm uh, on a computer screen as part of a simulation, and so um, you know it was lacking in that it wasn't using the actual robot; it was using a simulation of it. The air octor uh, really has—it was just kind of part of one of the octarm studies, uh, testing the user interface that they came up with it. Um, with for it. And uh, again, this was very informal testing that didn't record any actual quantitative data. And so you can see how this gives us a big void to fill um, by generating user testing that reports rigorous data being collected. And so as you can see, that's kind of our third goal, um, is to record significant quantitative data both to fill this void in the field and because Inherently, quantitative data is better, really, than qualitative data because it provides a more objective measurement. Uh, some of our other goals from user testing were to get an idea of how we might be able to improve the robot, uh, just based on any difficulties the users had during the testing, and to get an idea of how well tasks could be performed with the robot, which we didn't really have to do any extra work for because user testing itself necessitates that certain tasks are accomplished. However, by designing these tasks such that they were able to either mimic real-world tasks that disabled people might uh, accomplish using the arm, or to at least demonstrate the potential for being able to accomplish these kind of tasks, we were able to kind of make a statement on how this arm, a uh, bendy arm, might actually be effective as an assistive manipulator in the real world. Uh, and so for the testing, we split it into two separate rounds. Uh, in the first round, the goal was to test as many people as possible with a very simple task and go through all three of the control schemes that we had devised uh, with the main goal of determining what was the most effective control scheme so that we could move forward into the second round and do more in-depth, more complex testing with a smaller number of users. Okay, so just like Ryan just got done saying, um, the goal for our first round of testing was to go through a lot of users, have them use all three of the control schemes, and hopefully determine which one was most intuitive and effective. So the task for this one was very simple. All we had to do, you can see the setup here, all they had to do was pick up the nut and drop it in the cup on the other side of the robot. Um, so our procedure entailed first introducing the three control schemes. Um, we varied the order each time just to counteract the learning effect. Um, and after we introduced each control scheme, we allowed the user one minute to practice, get a feel for how it works. 
Um, and after all three control schemes had been introduced, we had them run through the trial three separate times, once using each control scheme, and we, of course, timed them as they did so. And then at the end, we, had, we gave them a brief survey. Um, it asked for their age and any relevant joystick experience they may have had, just to kind of control for any of those confounding variables. Um, we also had them rank the control schemes based on intuitiveness, just because intuitiveness doesn't always correlate with effectiveness, so we wanted to get their actual opinions on them. And at the end, there was just an open-ended question asking for general feedback or suggestions, which we took into consideration for improvements to the robot. Okay, so um, we wound up testing uh, 14 subjects, uh, and the data is presented here. So we can sort of see a trend that uh, single joystick compensated has the fastest average completion time and the uh, highest, well, lowest ranking, but number one is the best. So uh, the best ranking for uh, intuition score. Um, but these standard deviations are actually fairly large. So it's not enough data to make a very conclusive statement about which control scheme is actually the best. Um, but what we can do is see sort of that in general, we, we observe a trend that people complete the task faster with compensative and they sort of notice that uh, comp uh, single joystick compensative control is the easiest for them to use, at least as a new user. Uh, so we, uh, we came up with some ideas as to why this might be. Um, and we basically think that it's because uh, single joystick compensative is the simplest of the control schemes to actually like, just pick up and use. So it requires the least amount of user input. You don't have to control two joysticks simultaneously. Uh, and it sort of does the work for you. So you don't have to like, uh, try to manually compensate for the motion of the, the mechanical coupling to the two segments. It tries to do that for you. And it makes these motions where precise positioning, like, precise positioning is more important uh, it just makes this a little bit easier. Now, uh, the cost of this, of course, is that you actually get some reduced functionality because the robot tries to solve these problems for you that you might be able to solve faster. So in dual joystick mode, you could simultaneously control both segments with both hands and probably do these tasks faster than if you were using this uh, compensative mode. But in general, we found that people were not very good at doing that. They didn't learn that fast enough. They didn't grasp that concept quick enough. And it requires a, a decent amount of understanding to do that. So you have, you have to know the robot pretty well to, to be able to make use of that. Um, we also uh, did control for things like age and joystick uh, experience and that sort of thing. We actually found that there was no significant impact of uh, any of those on the testing results. So people all sorts of different ages, did, none of them did any like significantly better or worse. Um, and basically, that just sort of goes to show that uh, with the data we have, uh, it seems to be the best to proceed on with the, the single joystick compensative mode. Additionally, this uh, joystick uh, scheme has the advantage of being a single joystick mode, um, which in assistive technology, having a minimal number of inputs is very important. If you have someone that uh, doesn't have function in one of their arms and or, or say has very minimal function in one hand but has another functional arm, they want to still be able to use that arm. So you let them control the robot with their weaker side and then uh, they regain a lot more functionality than sort of uh, probably even losing functionality if you require them to use both hands to control the robot. So that's one of the main reasons that we went for these single joystick schemes. Uh, and one thing I'd like to point out real quick is that uh, the reason that the histogram is included on this slide is just to kind of bolster our conclusion that compensative uh, was the most effective um, control scheme. As you can see, I mean, we said that the standard deviations are very high, which they are, but as you can see, there's this massive outlier in the compensative uh, that really drags, both drags up its completion time and raises the standard deviation a lot. And really, if you look at the histogram, it's pretty clear that uh, compensative is, in fact, the most effective. Um, so for round two of this testing, we used single joystick compensative because that was determined most effective in round one. Um, the goal was to see how much or to what extent people were able to improve their performance and their understanding of how the robot works uh, across a series of trials. So in this round, we had two separate tasks that we had users perform. The first one was the peg pegboard task, it was the simpler of the two. You can see the setup in the top right corner. Um, for this task, the user had to pick up the first peg and move it into a different hole on the same pegboard, and then pick up the second peg and move it into a different hole on the pegboard on the other side of the robot. 
So we had them do this three times each in the first two sessions and six times in the last section, session. Um, and then there was the drawer task, a little bit more complicated. Um, we had them open the drawer, remove a metal nut from inside the drawer, um, drop the nut in the cup on the other side of the robot, pick up the second nut, put the nut back in the drawer, and finally close the drawer. And of course, time ended when the drawer was finally closed. Um, so since that one was a little bit more intricate, took a little bit more time to complete, we only did two sessions of three tries each. Okay. Uh, and the results from that are presented here. So this is, a, this is again with only three users. Uh, because the time requirement was much higher. Um, and uh, we can sort of see the percent improvements across trial uh, session one, which consisted of three trials, and session three for the pegboy pass. So we can see uh, fairly large percent improvements, actually, uh, almost 50%, anywhere from 25, uh, 25 to 50% in sort of time improvement in the average times for each session. Um, we see a similar trend with the uh, drawer trials, although not near as high of a percent improvement, uh, anywhere from 8 to 35 percent improvement. Um, and again, we only had two sessions here. We expect that maybe this trend would continue if we did more testing, uh, but time was a serious constraint. Uh, the raw data from these trials is presented here uh, in these graphs. So we can see with the drawer trial, we have a, a fairly nice downward trend. The bolded line is the average. The red, green, and blue are the three individual users' scores. Um, so that, that sort of gives us a nice clear indication of a, of a decreasing uh, time to completion for these. And then in um, the peg and hole task, or the peg boy task, we can sort of see a similar trend, but it's a bit more messy, um, especially with outliers like this point here. Uh, one thing we did notice is that after trial number six, and this was on a day split, so this is where we, we, we took a break and we came back the next day and continued testing, uh, users tended to get significantly better. There was a very large drop off here. And we hypothesized that this is due to uh, sort of the user gaining proficiency in a task. So they've done it a few times, they start to understand what they need to do, and then they realize so suddenly something inside just sort of clicks and they understand like a much more optimal way to do the task. And that's sort of our hypothesis for this. Uh, so before I continue with this slide, I just did want to point out that um, the slides that we just discussed, uh, we were able to carry them out by testing subjects from within our group. So I'd just like to give like a quick acknowledgement. Uh, it was Evan, Jerica, and uh, Quok. So they really helped us out carrying out our research. Uh, and with that, I'll move right forward. Um, so beyond the tasks that we uh, completed in our user testing. Um, there are additional tasks that we've both demonstrated with our robot and proposed that our robot could accomplish either in its current state or with small uh, changes to the robot. Um, so some of the ones that we demonstrated are being able to pick up a set of keys and put them on hook and take them off. And uh, you know you can imagine this actually being a useful task for someone uh, using the robot in an assistive setting. Uh, just as the opening and drawer task that we completed in user testing would be. Uh, and pictures are shown here of accomplishing that task. Uh, we also were able to accomplish some back scratching with the robot, which may seem like sort of an esoteric and maybe trivial kind of task, but you would be surprised uh, the results that come out of surveys of disabled individuals, how often they mention things that seem kind of trivial like this, like scratching their nose or scratching their back, you know, things that you take for granted as an able-bodied individual, but that actually make a difference to people with disabilities. Uh, in addition, uh, there are other tasks that we have not actually demonstrated, but proposed that the robot uh, could be capable of, such as unlocking doors. Uh, it could probably do that, maybe not, it could maybe not do with a key in a lock right now, because that's kind of a more complicated twisting motion, but if you could imagine the kind of door where it's bolted and you move over the bolt, we think that uh, in its current state, bendy arm could probably complete that kind of task. Uh, you can imagine a multitude of different pick and place tasks that the robot could accomplish, and this is actually, in surveys, the uh, rated as the most important task that disabled people would like to be able to accomplish with robots, is just picking something up and putting it back down. Of course, right now the robot is limited by its uh, end effector, which is just an electromagnet and can only grab magnetic things. But you can easily imagine that by swapping it out with a more versatile end effector, uh, the robot can pick up all sorts of things within its payload capacity. 
another task uh, would be bathing, which as I said, um, there is already a robot in the academia that is intended to be used for bathing. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, continuum manipulators are good for this kind of task. And uh, bathing might be a kind of hard task to evaluate on a statistical measure, but we propose that it could be easier evaluated by um, you know, wiping whiteboard, which is the same kind of wiping task. Um, and this could be more quantitatively measured because you could measure how much of the whiteboard could be erased. Okay, so obviously then the arm is just a prototype. There's certainly plenty of room for improvement. So here's just a list of some of the most notable limitations of the robot in its current state. First of which has been mentioned a couple times now, but it is the mechanical coupling of the robot, how you get um, undesired motion in one segment even though you're controlling the other. Um, so it makes it a little bit harder for the user to control, and it also made it harder for us to come up with more sophisticated control schemes, which is why we kept them relatively simple for the purpose of this research. Um, second major limitation is the backbone material. Um, it's low density polyethylene, which is very flexible, which allows us a great range of motion, but it's not entirely elastic, so it doesn't always return back to its central position when you go through the recentering protocol. So that um, kind of offset it as performance went on. Um, and additionally, because it is plastic, the payload capacity is pretty limited. We found that it was below half of a kilogram. Um, a third thing, of course, as Ryan mentioned, is the end effector. It is just an electromagnet, so you can only pick up light metallic objects and, um, with the robot in its current state. So hopefully a future iteration would have a more, um, adapti or more adaptable, more versatile um, gripping mechanism in place of the electromagnet. Um, another thing to mention is that it is tethered. You have to plug it into a power outlet, so that restricts where you can place it. And uh, finally, it has a pretty bulky base, which isn't ideal for mounting it on wheelchairs, which would be a good application of it as we are looking at the field of assistive technology. So the base and all of the other limitations mentioned would need to be addressed in future iterations. So those are the limitations. Uh, some of the highlights of the robot include its low cost. Uh, our final bill of materials was $574.85. And although this would not, this does not resemble a uh, production quality cost of the robot, you can imagine that uh, when you compare it to commercially available arms, which cost somewhere in the tens of thousands of dollars range, uh, that this robot, even in its production stage, would still be relatively cheap. Uh, the simplicity we also consider to be a highlight. Um, there are no sensors attached to the robot. A uh, minimal amount of programming is required due to the fact that it has inherent safety and so you don't have to program in safety measures. And it can be built by unskilled individuals using widely available parts. Uh, for this reason, we believe that the robot represents a potential open source platform that other people could build upon. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to really quick run through some of the future research here. Uh, we're looking at iterating the design of the prototype um, user testing with a uh, actual target population, so actually people with disabilities. Uh, all of our user testing was limited to fully able-bodied people, um, and also a uh, like a, an actual comparison between the existing tech and what we're proposing. So right now we have no comparison between arms like the Jayco or Manus arm and uh, this continuum technology that we're looking at. Uh, it's going to be a lot of work before we can get there because there's things like uh, mainly is the fact that that is nowhere near as sophisticated as uh, as the Jayco arm. Materials need to be beefed up. All that stuff that was mentioned before. But if those changes are made, uh, you could potentially see running actual comparisons with existing technology, actual price comparisons, that sort of thing, to get to the point where this could potentially replace some of that uh, technology. Okay. So what's the big takeaway? Basically, Bendy Arm is a continuum manipulator which we believe uh, could be applied to the assistive technology field. Uh, its continuum design might make it more optimal than currently available uh, assistive robotic manipulators due to its inherent safety and low cost. Uh, we back up this claim with our user testing in which we uh, had subjects demonstrate the ability to complete a wide range of tasks with minimal training and quantitative evidence showed that users could improve using the arm in a relatively low amount of time. The future research that should be completed with this arm would include iterating it, testing it with the target population, which is actual disabled individuals, and then having a direct comparison between this arm and commercially available arms to kind of give an idea of whether this might be a better alternative. 